I'm so excited to have you see today's show. A couple of my buddies, a couple of doctors, both female, are going to be on the show today. Margaret Christensen is an OBGYN and also practices functional and integrative medicine. You'll want to hear what she has to say. And then Julia Schulenberg, she's a naturopathic doctor. She's going to discuss what's with this explosion of neurological diseases we're seeing in children. That couldn't be linked to fungus, mold, etc., could it, or their environment. I'm going to open the show with this. Melanoma. Is there a fungal component to melanoma? Then I'm going to end it with this. Animals eat feed. We eat food. Both seem to have mycotoxins in them. What do we do about that? Watch. For the past 45 years, I have dedicated my life and my whole career to finding the root cause of disease. And I now know with certainty that we must play a role in our own health care. I'm a self-care advocate. And you know what? Every time you change your diet for the better, exercise, or swallow a nutritional supplement, so are you. Now welcome to Know the Cause. Okay, friends, we need to talk a little bit about something that over 100,000 adults are diagnosed in a doctor's office in the U.S. alone with melanoma. I remember the uh, Troy Aikman, the star Dallas Rockets or whoever we have out here, a football team, uh, he ended up with melanoma on his back and he was successfully treated. Well, what causes those little moles, those little hyperpigmented round things on our body, what causes those? Nobody's ever asked that question. Why do they progress to cancer sometimes? Oh, they're all over that. But I have to wonder, uh, Doug's hypothesis, I have to wonder if those little moles aren't a collective group of fungi. Doug, that's crazy. You see, if they were, and if they contain melanin, then UV light, being out in the sun, surfing, enjoying the poolside, would increase your risk not only of getting those little moles, but them progressing to cancer. Okay, go with me here. Is there a fungus link to melanoma, bad cancer, folks. This isn't a good one. According to the Oxford Dictionaries, melanoma is a tumor of melanin-forming cells. Okay, I got you, Doug. Especially a malignant tumor associated with skin cancer. Malignant or melanoma risk factors, ultraviolet, hey, the sun, are clearly a major cause of melanoma, says cancer.org. So melanin-forming cells plus excessive sunlight exposure in certain people equals melanoma. But where does that melanin come from? What are those little moles that people get all over their body? When I worked in dermatology with Dr. David Weekly, a Johns Hopkins guy out here in Dallas, they would, people would come in, we're fearful, all of us are fearful full time, and we'd come in and have our body examined of these little moles, and he'd get this little ocular out, and he'd look at it, and he'd shine a light on it. Uh, amazing uh, that they do that. Uh, but many people were diagnosed with melanoma. And I always wanted to know. He showed me a few of them on people's backs. See, Doug, this is a melanoma. Okay, you know, what caused that? Well, we don't know. Too much sunshine. God made a mistake putting the sun up there. Folks, you would never light a match and let it burn down until it burns your fingers. Why would you go out in the sun for an hour and let it burn you until you need aloe vera or some kind of cream all over your body? Worse, in my humble opinion, are sun tanning liquids that you put on your body and then bake the sun in. But that isn't about this. Okay, let's go to the next graphic here. Melanin is a group of natural pigments found in most organisms. I didn't know that. Don't fungi make melanin? Yes, some do. Look at this from microbiology 10 years ago. Melanin has been isolated from several important human fungal pathogens. And the polymetric pigment is now recognized as an important virulence determinant. In other words, fungus can make the melanoma worse. Wow, you just add to that fungus, sunlight, and bingo, folks, we figured out melanoma. But here's the logical. Could melanoma be a skin fungal condition activated by overexposure to sunlight? It couldn't be that simple, because these doctors would have figured that out long ago. If so, hey, Doug, wouldn't antifungal drugs treat melanoma? I mean, these are logical questions, folks. We're captive in a doctor's office. We didn't go through melanoma school. Um, we are questions, you know, doctor, what caused it? We don't know. Yeah, I bet you hung out a lot by the pool. Yeah, I did. But what activated? It was sunlight. On what? On a little mole. Where'd the moles come from? 
are we learning today? Isn't this good? Okay. New treatment for melanoma. It's a drug called, it's an anti-worm drug called mebendazole. And this comes out of molecular cancer research about a dozen years ago. Our researchers suggest that this screening approach is useful for identifying agents that show promise in the treatment of even chemoresistant melanoma. In other words, chemotherapy doesn't help them. And identifies mebendazole as a potent melanoma-specific cytotoxic agent. It kills melanoma cells. Mebendazole, it's only used to kill worms. You know, it's people who go into the doctor and they notice worms inside their gut. Take this mebendazole. But remember, fungi and worms are parasites. So it not only kills worms, let's go to the next graphic. What is this mebendazole, Doug? It's called MBZ. Repurposing mebendazole, says the headline, as a cancer drug. you got to be kidding me. Now we've come full cycle. It kills worms and cancer cells. In vivo, that means inside the body, mebendazole treatment as a single agent or in combination with chemotherapy led to the reduction or complete arrest of tumor growth. Folks, either alone or with chemotherapy. Why would you do chemotherapy? They're not going to stop. Alone arrested melanoma growth. That's all I read. Okay? How might mebendazole, oh, how might it be used to treat melanomas, this drug mebendazole? Mebendazole is a uh, something developed by Janssen Pharmaceutical in 1973 as a broad spectrum anti-helminic. Okay, this is a drug that kills worms, was shown to have antifungal activity. Aha, it kills fungus. Okay, no wonder it helps cancer. Finally, know this about melanoma and fungus. Subungual uh, melanoma nail fungus has been mistaken for nail cancer and vice versa. Sporinox, an FDA-approved antifungal drug, treats melanoma. These results suggest that this agent, Sporinox, has several potent anti-melanoma features. That's what we need to know. Is it cancer? Is it fungus? Now you'll be smarter in the doctor's office. Oh my gosh, we're having too much fun, right? Sidebar. Okay. Uh, Dr. Margaret Christensen is here with me right now. She's an integrative medicine specialist. OBGYN was her primary specialist. And then she got sick. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put her back together. I've always said, folks, there's no better physician than one who has had to walk down this track where their medications, anti-inflammatories, antidepressants, couldn't get them better because they were living in a sick building. People get sick. And often it's because buildings are sick. Absolutely. Welcome to the show. Thank that, you so much, Doug, for having me again. It's that's a hard pleasure. story to hear. Every time you and it I is. talk, I it hear is. that on some of these seminars. Mm -hmm. And it breaks my heart. But really, it's really God opening your eyes and well, saying, Well, okay. you know, I, I have to, you know, I, I do have to believe that really God was working through me. And that, you know, my I got sick. My whole family got sick. And I couldn't figure out what was wrong. It actually took eight years. Because we're not trained conventionally right. to understand that all the chronic disease we're seeing, Doug, in this country is really, uh, there's environmental and stress. I mean, you put those, those two things together. Our food supply, our water supply, our air quality is uh, just, it's just, just going down the drains. And, but the good news is, Doug, you know, as you know, our bodies can heal themselves. And that's, I, that's what got me on this journey, got me to functional medicine. I teach nationally for the Institute of Functional Medicine, so I've been an educator for a long time, as well as working with my own clients. But uh, it was, you know, I had severe chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia. I had to close my practice. I had a very successful OB mm. practice because I couldn't think anymore. And I was, you know, my body was hurting. And I was told, oh, here, take your antidepressants. You know, here's your pain medicine. Go see a physical therapist. Can I ask yeah. you, Dr. Christensen, what was the point at which you said, okay, there's something in our home? Because you and I didn't know each other then. Right. What, at what point did you say, whoa? Well, actually, I didn't even know because... Um, I got so sick I had to close my practice, so I, had, I was successful, I got right. one of the fancy streets in Dallas, you know, that um, here was this you know, beautiful old home, and I, ha I wasn't working anymore, so we couldn't stay there, and we had to move out. When we moved out on the inspection, we found there was black mold all underneath the house. Again, I didn't know. I didn't know right. anything. We just took everything with us, you know, we'd right. and whatever. Fortunately, the person who bought it, we just paid them a little extra, and I didn't know, and I couldn't get better, and I couldn't get better. Uh, I mean, I was still feeling so sick, and finally somebody put me on some nutrients. That turned me around, 
And it wasn't until I was re-exposed eight years later in a moldy office building, went to see Dr. Ray oh, at Bill the Ray. Environmental Health wow. Center. What a great guy. Uh, and he said, this is mold. And I realized, oh my God, that's why eight years ago, everybody in my family got sick and not everybody's better. I've gotten re-sick again. And, uh, and one of my children has just, um, to, to this day, he's incredibly, incredibly mentally ill. You don't see just women. You still do OBGYN, mm -hmm. but you mm -hmm. certainly have mm -hmm. a dozen people yeah. at your office, yeah. different disciplines, yeah. right? Yeah, so we have a whole collaborative practice. Um, I don't do obstetrics anymore. I do okay. uh, some of the GYN side at a hospital. Right. Uh, but uh, no, we do. We see the entire spectrum of folks. We see a lot of mystery illnesses. The folks who come to see us, they've already been to 10, 15, 20 different specialists. They've been to Mayo. They've been to the medical schools. Right. And nobody's figuring it out because, Doug, we are not trained in environmental medicine. And that's what's making us sick. Our diets, our water, our air, and, of course, our disconnection uh, from something greater than ourselves and the level of stress and that we're being bombarded with from television, from you know um, all the social media, from all the negativity, work, 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 work. So um, you, we work with all those. You have a unique approach. Yeah. <clears throat> I've heard you say this before, that we may be sitting ducks mm -hmm. for new viruses, new mutated viruses or bacteria, et cetera, mm -hmm. coming into our environment just because we've been exposed to mold yes. in the past. Talk about that. Oh, absolutely. So one of the critical f uh, factors is understanding that toxic mold suppresses the part of the immune system, it's called the innate, mm -hmm. which surveils for bacteria, viruses, cancer cells, Doug. And then it overactivates the part that's called the adaptive. That's the one that produces all those cytokines. And now everybody in this country has heard about the word cytokine now. Right. So we have a lot of cytokines, suppressed immune system. You can't find those viruses. You can't get rid of them. You can't find those cancer cells. You can't find those bacteria that are causing you illness. Yeah. She's a great friend. Uh, we've uh, done a couple of seminars together. Really enjoy always hearing you. And more importantly, I enjoy planting a seed in the audience Absolutely. mind. Mold is a big deal. Mold gives off poisons called mycotoxins, and that sets you up for an unhealthy future. Why? They suppress your immune system. Thank you, Dr. Chris. You're welcome. Thank you, you so much, Doug. You bet. Thanks for having me. Uh -huh. Dr. Julia Schulenberg, a buddy of ours, uh, is here today. She's out near the airport, uh, DFW Airport. I sure welcome you and I sure thank you for what you've done for so many people we've sent to you. Uh, my wife and I get uh, nice texts and letters from people that we thought Dr. J uh, could help. Thank you for what you do. What, what is the, t you're a naturopathic doctor, you uh, have a bachelor's degree in nursing, you're a certified lymph therapist also, thank you for that. Who is your stereotypical patient that walks into your center there? Um, I have chronic um, Lyme patients mm -hmm. that have already been diagnosed. I have um, neurological um, um, patients who've been um, injured with vaccines or else other neurotoxins and they can't uh, get any help or they've, um, uh, they have just exhausted all of the resources that they knew of. Um, and, then, and then I have some simpler cases such as um, allergies and uh, just brain dis other brain disorders and then sometimes cancer as well. You, but uh, I get a lot of people with fungal overload and parasitical infection uh, overload And as about well. back when you were a nurse for 16 or 18 years, you didn't see a lot of that. Today, you know, you have to wonder about the HVAC uh, systems. And my concern is not vaccines per se. I like the idea of launching an immune response to an antigen, making an antibody to it mm -hmm. for protection. My question is some of the adjuvants that they're putting in. And I know mm -hmm. they're putting these in uh, to help the immune system defend itself better uh, and launch a better antibody response. But you're right. There are things, uh, mercury, there are things that kids today, do you see children? Well, the, uh, yes, I do. I see a growing number of pediatrics, and um, they've had neurological symptoms maybe because of an um, uh, vaccine, I'm going to call it some vaccine injury because uh -huh. of the mercury, the aluminum, some of the uh, overload of the uh, other viruses that were in the vaccines and their immune systems could not handle it. Uh, so there, there's an inflammatory response that occurs and then some of these uh, 
uh, children who have higher testosterone levels and who also have um, maybe some genetic SNPs, they, mm. uh, they don't respond as well to the vaccines, and, uh, but then the uh, general population uh, don't know that or they don't realize that. Um, and then, uh, then they come in with uh, fungal, fungal overload and fungal problems, but then a lot of the fungal problems are even exacerbated by the increase in the amount of electromagnetic radiation that we're surrounded by because there were studies in Europe, uh, Dr. Klinghart, Dr. Rao in Switzerland, some Russian uh, studies, and also a study in New York at a university in New York where they found uh, large amounts of mold toxicity that would grow when it was um, surrounded by uh, high levels of electromagnetic radiation. And th those, uh, not only are yeast strains and certain fungi, but also certain uh, Lyme pathogens and parasites are fueled by increased levels of electromagnetic radiation. I like. I like what you told us when we brought Berkeley in to see you, and that is everybody that comes in here represents a thumbprint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are layers. Uh, yes. Some people, maybe it is toxicity, uh, maybe it's heavy metals, uh, maybe it's mold in their homes. Mm -hmm. But folks, you can't, there isn't a supplement. I wish there were that you could swallow uh, to eliminate all that. It's kind of, you've got to dig in. If you're my age, it's going to take longer. If you're six years old, it may not take as long. I mean, that's what you're finding. Everybody is different. Everybody is different because everybody has a different genetics and also everybody expresses their genes differently based upon their internal environment and their external environment and their belief, even their belief system and their way of thinking. That is called epigenetics and that's a whole other topic that I would love to talk about some other time. But I consider epigenetics and uh, the internal uh, environment and the external environment as being um, um, to be considered more than just uh, a person's genotyping on a piece of paper. Yeah, uh, we're told everything is genetics is what Dr. J is saying and genetics is the hand mom and dad dealt you. Epigenetics around the hand, can you alter your epigenetics? You bet you can. There are ways to do that. You know, I was just sitting here thinking while I was talking to you about the thumbprint that you taught us originally. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all different. Your hypertension might be caused by this. Yet if I go to a doctor and I have hypertension, I'm going on an antihypertensive pill. If my cholesterol is a little bit, you're going to take an anti. If I'm infected, you're going to get an antibody. Thank you for the personal approach you supply. I realize doctors, medical doctors, have to see huge numbers of patients a day. I love where you are at this point in your life, and I love what you've done for the people we've referred to you. Thank you. Thank it's just an honor to Thank see you. you. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. Okay, we want to talk about mycotoxins in our animal food and in our food. Why? Because mycotoxins can cause serious disease, one of which is cancer. And our doctors today think, well, the exposure isn't that great. I'm here to teach you. I'm not here to make a decision for you or your doctor. A knowledgeable person sitting in that exam room is a good person. If you can understand the doctors don't understand what these mycotoxins are or where we come in contact with them, then you'll have kind of a leg up on what he or she may say about your diagnosis. Understand this as we enter this. Feed is what cows and pigs and chickens eat. Food is what we humans eat. Now that's a good jumping off point. Let's go here now. When animal feed is grain, mycotoxins are common. The co-occurrence, that means one mycotoxin or more, of mycotoxins is very common in animal food, okay? Mycotoxins are poisons made by about 300 species of fungi. This article on allaboutfeed.net, it's a great website, this article points to how common it is in farms to have several mycotoxins in up to 60% of animal feed. You know, animals eat a lot of corn. This is what fattens them, okay? I don't know if they eat wheat, they eat hay, et cetera. Um, folks, the take-home message here is in over half, and this isn't in Zimbabwe. I mean, it is, but it's even here in America. And we tend to think, remember, the FDA has tested all this. In, in your defense and my defense, the FDA has tested all this uh, back in the 1990s and said, no, this is all safe. Remember the feed we give to animals. 
the animals eat these mycotoxins, then we sacrifice the animals and we eat it for dinner. Okay? That's what I want you to know. Mycotoxins are common in animal feed. New data, this comes out of that allaboutfeed.net. New data shows mycotoxins are not under control as of 2018. In Europe, and there is that word, North America, those two words, contamination levels of all main mycotoxins saw an increase in the second quarter compared to the first quarter of this year. You and I live in North America. That should scare you. Um, there's so much more I have in my brain that I could tell you, but um, look, I, I live a grain-free diet, and if I'm going to eat meat, I eat grass-fed, different from grain-fed meat. It's just me. Uh, okay, uh, now let's go to this one. Mycotoxins found in animal feeds. Most commonly, vomitoxin, xerelinone, fumonisin, T2 toxin, ocrotoxin, and aflatoxin. Big words, I'm sorry to stick you with all of that. Uh, but fumonisin B1 and B2, ocrotoxin A and aflatoxin are definitely or possibly linked to cancer in humans according to the International Agency for Research. Okay? Then the journal Carcinogenesis 10 years ago said this, these are proven animal carcinogens that are common contaminants of dietary staple in the food for millions of people. You and I fall into that millions of people again. It, it strikes me as just amazing that our medical communities don't know this. Feed Mycotoxin in America in 2019, all about feed.com, states fumonisin and deoxyribonucleinol are highly prevalent in North and Central America. Both regions are rated to be at extreme risk of mycotoxin threat to livestock. In North America, here are the samples, DON, deoxyribonucleinol, shows an average medium concentration of this, right? Besides DON and fumonisin, xerelinone is an issue. I mean, 61% of the samples were contaminated with this xerelinone. Take home message, folks. Be careful out there, okay? If, uh, think about a diet without exposure to corn and peanuts and meats and so forth. That's what I've done and as an old guy. I feel really good. I hope that helps. Don't stop eating this based on this. Always share this information with your doctor and ask, should I be concerned about this? That's where I want this to go. Thank you so much. Both doctors, Margaret Christensen, a medical doctor talking about the concern of mold, folks. Doctors have to begin thinking that way. And she thought that way because it happened to her. So many doctors who get into mold have it themselves. They or their children or their husbands get into it. Thank God she is well. Thank God her family's well. Thank God she's talking about it. And then Julia Schulenberg, thank you, Dr. Schulenberg, for coming in and teaching us a little bit about limes and neurological factors and so forth. I hope you enjoy this show. I trust that you will tell your friends. God bless you. Take care.